We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, for this, uh, dear host. Uh, fully, fully understand the difficulties with these Zoom bombing that you need to prevent. And uh, thank you all for, for, for all you do. Also, deep thanks to the Polish government for hosting and, and Mac for all the work done to make the IGF a success under exceptional circumstances. I'm Martin Wotterman, I'm chairman of the ICANN board, and it's a pleasure for me to present to you the open forum session, the building blocks to meaningful connectivity. For that, I'll be joined by uh, the panelist, uh, Manal Ismail, uh, a colleague board member, but also chair of the government advisory committee of, of ICANN. Danko Jeftovic, a colleague board member, but also a former member of the MAG, and uh, Joram Marby, for, uh, also a board member, but also president and CEO of the organization of ICANN. And in the room, uh, we get assisted by Avri Doria, and uh, for online participation, uh, Laurent uh, Ferrari will, will organize. So this session is really about how do we expand? This session will focus on building blocks to ease barriers to access and increase creation of local content in support of the VISIS Action Line 3, Access to Information and Knowledge, as well as the Action Line 8, Cultural Diversity and Identity, Linguistic Diversity and Local Content. To the promotion of the universal acceptance and the use of internationalized domain names, so this is scripts other than just a Latin script. Uh, and uh, we will take you through uh, an overview of ICANN's work. And uh, we can hear from the panelists to share local experiences with the Arabic and the Cyrillic script. So with that, Joram, would you please be unmuted to speak next? And please keep me unmuted, your host. Thank you, thank you, Martin. Let's thank you. Uh, let's take a step back and for a second. Just think about why this is so important, as a, uh, in, especially in the world of meaningful connectivity. The internet is often referred to as a global phenomenon, which it is, but it's actually quite local as well. And, and to be able to localize internet going forward, we have to be even better when it comes to making sure that people can use the internet using their own keyboard, their own script, their own narrative. Uh, this is very much in line with, with VISIS, for instance, uh, from the uh, Action Line 3, when we talked about to enable culture, diversity, identity, linguistic diversity, and local content. Um, and, and I can, together with our technical partners, and other ones, spend, has a very important role of doing this. Um, today, we have a real digital divide between people who have access to internet and people who don't have access to internet. But one of the reasons why we have this digital divide is because a lot of people cannot use the internet even if they had it because of language. But it's not only ICANN uh, and its partners has a role in this. This is a whole ecosystem that needs to come together. Uh, manufacturers of software, uh, how you work with, uh, how you work with web pages, uh, manufacturers of equipment. Uh, we all have to work together to make this. And, and the good thing is that I've, we, are, we are starting to do many things together, but we still have a long road to go. Well, in ICANN, in the ICANN community, we've been working to raise awareness of this for, for a very long time. It's sort of, it's a part of our DNA and one of the reasons why we believe that the internet is important. Because we see, in a way, internet as the, I mean, we often talk about the internet from a commercial thing, uh, create some digital 
abilities for people, but it's actually a big equalizer as well. If we get people to be online, you give them the same kind of information. You give people, poor people, uh, the, the same kind of access to the same kind of information as the rich always have a monopoly on. That's why this is so important that they also can use the internet with their own language. So we can have really use that information. Well, for many years, this has been an effort by ICANN board as well uh, to support what we call IDNs uh, and more, more recently to work with or what we call the universal acceptance. Uh, we even have a dedicated board IDN, uh, universal acceptance working group, which means three to four, five to a year. And, and I think that you know, if, if we look at the next sort of generation of internet, uh, where we are looking into what we call the next round or the localization of internet or the global localization of the internet, this is going to be one of the biggest challenges we have to really have the ability to have more than just 1600 identifiers, most of them in Latin script on the internet, to really create an opportunity for people around the world to use their own keyboard and scripts. And I think that this is our collective responsibility um, to make sure that the internet speaks more languages and the people's use these languages. The, in, in another way of saying is that the first generation of what we've done today with internet is to make it in, sort of interoperable uh, for machines, which is one of the great advantages of the internet. Maybe one way of saying this is what we're trying to do with the Universal Acceptance of IDN is to make it for people instead, to make it interoperable for people. And that's a big challenge where we're going to need to work together. We go the the ITU um, thinks that the, you know, they, they, I'm reading from the numbers here. There's a strong global growth in internet use, with the estimated number of people who have used the internet surging to almost five billion in 2021, from an estimated 4.1 in 2019, which is 800 million more users since 2019. But many of those uh, comes from or what I would call well-off areas. They live in cities, they live in strong economies, um, and they, they rate the sort of, they get the best out of this of using the internet technology. It's gonna be harder to reach the next ones, uh, the poor, the underpoverished around the world uh, who has to make real choices. And one of them, I think that's gonna help them is to get access to local information in their local languages. So I want to leave over to the rest of the panel to talk about it, but I think that what we're talking about here is not meaningful connectivity seems to be a technical word. But if you look at the internet as an enabler and an equalizer, this is something that is important for us. Thank you. Thanks, Jerome, for that. Uh, what is ICANN doing to and the ICANN community to help communities around the world to provide access to internet and local languages? Can you unmute Duron, please? Dear host. Thank you. Can you, um, yes, thank you. You're unmuted. Well, for us, it's a lot of practical work in what we do. And I think I covered a little bit in my introduction what we do. But I want to, maybe I would change the fact that the, the way we work, when we often talk about the institution of ICANN, we actually talk about a cooperation of people from all over the world that comes together. Um, to 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 really to make the what we call the uh, IDN tables uh, to make sure we can test the different scripts so we can put that into the systems, making sure it's a very technical thing to make sure the two scripts, for instance, doesn't compete with each other. So the keyboard that people are using is connected to it. But I think one of the most challenging things right now, which we also work together in the ICANN community, and this is our volunteers who does this work. Uh, is the actual fact that to get to broaden it through universal acceptance through contacts with manufacturers, suppliers, and other one as well, so they all understand the, the, how is important this is. And as I mentioned, also the board has, since a couple of years, set up a special ta task group because of this importance. Yeah, thank you for that, uh, Jeroen. And we can always talk more about it when questions come up or when it comes up. Uh, next, uh, can I ask you, Manal, to share more about your local experiences in Egypt? Manal Ismail, so, uh, please. Yes, please. You are muted, Manal. Um, thank you very much, uh, Martin, Joren, and, and everyone. Um, and 
Uh, as uh, Jorun mentioned, I would like to start by the statistics as well. So the world's population is uh, 7.9 million, according to the most recent uh, statistics by the UN as of October 2021. And um, uh, given the la latest estimates by the ITU as well, so 4.9 billion users are now online, accounting for around 62 to 63% of the world's population, which indicates that we have uh, something like 37 to 38% uh, still offline, uh, accounting to uh, around 3 billion. And this means that uh, their needs um, haven't yet uh, been met. And um, the global pandemic as well has also exposed and amplified the need for having meaningful connectivity or meaningful access for everyone in order uh, not to risk being uh, cut off from critical online services uh, or deprived from uh, vital information. Um, and to bring these uh, 3 billion online, we should address the real needs, which obviously uh, are needs uh, different from those who are currently connected. And um, also, we shouldn't expect the next billions uh, to, to master a foreign language. Uh, they are expected to come from the, the developing world and... Uh, um, language barrier would certainly be uh, one uh, of their, uh, of their uh, barriers to be online. Um, I have to say that the introduction of IDNs was a great achievement uh, in that respect, uh, providing the needed flexibility regarding the script of the registered domain. Uh, but we have to admit that the full benefits of IDNs won't be attained without uh, the wide deployment of universal acceptance um, in order to avoid a frustrating, a frustrated user uh, and uh, to ensure seamless end-to-end -end multilingual experience, which is key to enabling those who have a language barrier. And um, taking the uh, Arabic language as an example here, um, so the Arabic <laughs> in principle is written right to left and not even left to right uh, with a very different set of uh, characters. So um, unless we have a, a seamless experience end to end, uh, meaning that uh, all systems and applications need to uh, be able to accept, validate, process, store, and display local scripts. Uh, because sometimes um, um, only the first step is accommodated, uh, being that the, the application, for example, uh, accepts the, the local scripts, but then when uh, using the reverse lookup and displaying it again, it is displayed uh, in uh, the xn dash dash, for example, uh, coding. So uh, the, the, the ultimate objective is uh, having, a, as I said, a seamless end-to-end -end, uh, multilingual experience, uh, which uh, would uh, enable uh, a full, um, uh, a full multilingual experience end-to-end -to, -end to the end user. Uh, one more thing we witnessed uh, when talking about Arabic domain names um, is also everyone asking about uh, uh, email addresses in Arabic. So it's also critically important that uh, email addresses also uh, work seamlessly. Uh, and um, I have to say that this is uh, an existing demand uh, an existing demand for from um, the, the community uh, in Egypt. Um, so to, to, to complete uh, the multilingual experience of the end user, um, as I always say, we need to have uh, three pillars in place, uh, the, the IDNs, the universal acceptance and the content. So um, not having the content within our scope at ICANN uh, and, and having already IDNs in place, uh, I think we need to focus our efforts now on uh, 
promoting the universal acceptance and uh, making sure it is deployed as widely um, uh, as needed to get uh, started and to bear uh, its fruits. Thank you for that uh, very comprehensive uh, overview. Also, it, it sounds to me like that requires multiple stakeholders as well. Which, which stakeholders would you uh, need around the table? Uh, dear host, please unmute Manal again. Yes, you're unmuted. Thank okay, you. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, regarding the stakeholders, I think uh, all stakeholders are equally important in that respect. And without uh, collaborative and coordinated efforts, uh, the wide deployment of universal acceptance would take much longer, if not uh, forever. Um, governments are key and can provide proof of concept for the market to follow and serve as a role model in that respect for um, obvious strategic reasons. Uh, including the use of the official language of the country, of course, and having uh, online communication in local languages when uh, getting to use uh, governmental services. Also reaching citizens nationwide, irrespective whether they master a foreign language or not. Preserving the local culture and identity uh, of the country by protecting local languages and encouraging uh, their use uh, on and off the internet. Uh, acquiring future proof systems and applications, which is uh, important uh, for governments uh, being uh, uh, when they use public money. Um, and of course, ultimately, this serves in uh, bridging the digital divide, facilitating social inclusion, paving the way. Uh, for a digital transformation by um, increasing the internet penetration and promoting, uh, promoting uh, meaningful access. A private sector is also a, a critical stakeholder, being the supply side, uh, providing the service, and they should also be keen to allow for universal acceptance as it provides an edge to their business. Uh, implies market growth and is an opportunity for better customer satisfaction. Um, also, end users uh, are extremely important, constituting the demand side uh, of the whole thing. And without them, the supply side uh, wouldn't move. So it's important to make the end users aware of the option uh, in order to create demand and uh, put some pressure on the supply side uh, to act. Uh, and not only pressure, but uh, confidence business-wise that uh, uh, it makes sense and there is a demand for uh, uh, whatever they are going to avail. Um, so they need to act for a better user experience um, and uh, addressing the, the language barrier for new users, uh, but also the frustration of current users when uh, they make mistakes uh, emerging from second guesses of spelling, translation or transliteration uh, of uh, domain names. So I think all stakeholders are uh, equally important and uh, synchronized efforts uh, is uh, essential. And uh, collectively, we will be catering for the needs of the next billion and, and uh, helping to achieve the UN uh, SDGs and, and bridging the digital divide. So I see it win-win uh, for everyone. <laughs> Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that. And indeed, as you say, it's it's a wide range of players. No player can do it alone. So uh, thank you for sharing your experience. Uh, Danko, you, you're from Serbia and uh, Cyrillic is uh, the, the script I've seen you use before. So how does that work? How does that work in uh, on the Internet, in the audience, etc.? Please. Uh, yes, thank you, Martin, and thank you to the host for amusing me. Well, uh, my name is Dan Kriovtovic. Uh, uh, I am I'm from Serbia, as Martin said, and after Joran's icon-wide perspective and Manal's also wider perspective, I'll try to tell a bit of a local story how, how we have the situation in Serbia. It's a small developing country in Europe, and the uh, specifics of our situation is that Cyrillic script is our 
primary script and it's the official script, but actually we are using both Cyrillic and Latin script in the day-to-day -day work. So in my primary school, the language I learned was called Serbo-Croatian language, and half of my whole works were in Cyrillic and the other half in Latin script. So we use both, and that's why one of the reasons why uh, one Latin script dominated in the early days of the internet. But in the people that are only now in coming to the internet, there is a lot of people who are not from the uh, uh, more urban areas and a lot of people who actually use Cyrillic in, in everyday work. So it's very important. And we all know that the main names are actually enabled for content and services. And in that way, we need Cyrillic script to enable people to use fully Cyrillic in their, their internet approach. But there are complications. When I say Cyrillic, people often know that Cyrillic is one of the more successful scripts in the IDN space. But this is Russian Cyrillic that is different from the Serbian one. So in a way, we have different character sets here in our language. So it's not unique to the Cyrillic. I understand it's a bit of similarity uh, also with Arabic script that is used in Persian and Urdu. So it's, it's a more complicated situation. The only TLD, the Cyrillic TLD that is focused toward the Serbian users is the Serbian country code registry. Uh, of course, you can use Cyrillic in the other um, TLDs that are support wider character set. But what's the situation on, on the field? When .serbs, it's the Cyrillic TLD, started, one of the ideas was to create it as a, a lower cost option in order to enable people to get, uh, uh, to get easier uh, domain names, to, get, uh, to, to reduce the costs of going to the internet. And in a way, it hasn't worked very well because it also created this perception that there is a less value in that domain name comparing, for example, to .rs that the same country code registry promoted. And as Manal said, another problem is that emails are not functional. There are some solutions, but you cannot, cannot get, I cannot get my yevtoich.serb Cyrillic domain name with a Gmail or Office 365. And that's, that's a real problem. The other thing is that early internet adopters, as Joran indicated, started using internet with, with English language and with Latin script that is used in Serbia. So it kind of created this digital divide where people who are longer time on the internet kind of don't see the need to, to, to use Cyrillic a serial script in general use allows on the internet. But there are good developments. First of all, a Cyrillic script is a Serbian cultural identity. So we use it more and more also in marketing, in day-to-day -day communications. Some newspapers are now printed in Cyrillic, so it's, it's getting better. The second problem was keyboards. When you get a personal computer, you get notebook, it's a usual international brands and the keyboards are in Latin script. So you have software keyboards now and this is getting better. So in order to, to improve the situation, the registry did a, a local education campaign to explain how it is easy to use Cyrillic in general, but we kind of need more of a multi-stakeholder approach to that. One of the key point is governments and businesses. So government need to uh, put a request for universal acceptance in the tenders in procurement of the systems and everything. Businesses are uh, recognizing the importance of a uh, Cyrillic script in the, their web identity, but also uh, they're using now more and more of the Cyrillic the IDNs, but Currently, the situation that most of them are used as only redirects to the main um, Latin domain names. So it's a progress. Uh, this local community is active there. Uh, for example, uh, Serbia has given the chairs of ICANN's both Cyrillic and Latin generation panel. So people from this region are active in the broader global um, move that we are trying to do. And we are also active in the uh, ICANN's Universal Acceptance Steering Group. So in my opinion, 
and coming from this local story, it's a long-term effort. We are doing our best, but we have to keep uh, doing it. And we need to gather vendors, governments, end users, of course, the, the icon from its coordinating role, and to, to uh, build the environment that will enable that next billion or billions users to really come online, not only in small Serbia, but globally. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, very clear. And, and together you've, you've, you've uh, drawn a clear picture where it's clear that we as ICANN have, of course, an enabling role with making domain names available in IDNs. But it doesn't stop there. It's also needed at uh, browsers, at uh, email addresses, and eventually even the content. Uh, so it is uh, something we can only achieve to serve the, the, this next billion users together uh, uh, with others. Uh, so, and to do that, it's important we understand that there are the technical underpinnings of the internet that make these things work, how things hang together uh, uh, comes forward. So thank you for your clarity on that. A question to all panelists, and then I'd like to go to the audience, uh, is what recommendations or advice can you share with policymakers, with those policymakers engaged here at the IGF and, and beyond that want to serve their population with better uh, usability of the internet locally? Uh, can I ask you first, Joron? Uh, can you unmute Joron Morby, please, Secretariat? Yes, thank you. Okay. It's a very good question with a <laughs> with a complicated answer. I, I will start by saying by by not treating internet as it is done. We have a tendency in many of the discussions today to see that you know internet is what it is and everybody goes on a platform, and that's not really true. One of the important things in many of the interactions we have and I have, especially in the development projects we're talking about in Africa, is the recognition that. Um, the recognition, the importance of doing this for, for also the sort of local economy. Um, because it's, it's really, a, a country could really, when a country can really benefit from the development of using internet, it's when, when knowledge, um, business isn't always stay within the country. If it goes outside, it goes to the platform and it goes outside, the country doesn't really benefit from it. So I think that the recognition of, of the potential of this one is very important. The other thing of this is that the, the internet is a fantastic technology in its sense. I mean, uh, I learned a couple of weeks ago that the, the identifier system together, ICANN together with its technical partners, the root server operators, the, uh, the RE arsenal has actually been able to maintain the system without a flaw for 35 years. And, and we've seen uh, also including also the uh, resolver operators. I mean, it's fantastic that this technology has been able to grow from no one to, to so many people in such a short period of time. And often sort of developed and used with the users. It's not a committee, it's not a telecom company who came up with the notion of this, it was actually done for other reasons. But also recognize that this is, a, there are things that is bad on the internet. Everybody knows that. Um, and, and when you look at policies setting up for, for uh, for, uh, for for this for this part of the world, uh, look. Make sure that you I, let me use something I've said a couple of times this week. The road to health can be paid with very good intentions. So you don't do policies that actually can contradict the ability of using internet by having legislation that disconnect users from the internet or creates an alternative internet uh, because that you won't have those benefits. And making sure that the, the internet users in the country in the region have this diversity uh, of, of, of possibilities which the internet actually provides. Um, so, and, and so lastly, I would say, uh, please engage with us in the technical community as well. Uh, we will never tell you what your policy should be because we are not politicians. We are not interested in policy work, uh, but we are interested in to help you to connect more people on a diverse and open interoperable internet. So take those things into account. And, and many of us uh, in the technical community uh, are there to help and discuss. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeroen. And, and, and Manal, uh, 
I mean, from being very close to policymakers in your place, what could you recommend to those in other countries? Uh, well, what advice would you give them? Um, thank you, uh, Martin, for the question and the uh, host for unmuting me. Uh, so uh, I think um, uh, I would make sure to, um, again, reiterate the important strategic reasons uh, I already uh, highlighted earlier. I will not go through them uh, again one by one again, but uh, if I'm talking to policymakers, uh, I'll make sure to highlight uh, the strategic reasons for why uh, governments uh, should be keen to, uh, to have universal acceptance in place. Uh, sometimes um, um, people either don't know the benefit or are uh, reluctant to change that may seem unneeded. Uh, so it is important to highlight the need and, and make sure uh, they, they understand uh, the reasons and the strategic reasons behind this and how it's going to be uh, beneficial. Um, I, I would definitely stress the discussions around social inclusion, around digital transformation, um, and uh, around uh, the, the, the example that uh, is being provided by the current situation of the global pandemic and, and how we need to reach everyone and make sure everyone is online, uh, everything moved online, uh, whether um, health, uh, education, uh, or even day-to-day uh, -day activities. So. Uh, we need to make sure no, no one is left behind. And uh, maybe also draw some analogy with uh, the IPv6 experience and how this uh, uh, also um, uh, took some time to convince everyone to include. So maybe um, uh, around the same lines, governments could uh, include the need for universal acceptance in their um, tenders or purchase orders or uh, uh, anything they would like to uh, uh, to uh, to purchase. Um, on one hand, it gives a signal uh, that this is an uh, important uh, criteria uh, that the government uh, will be uh, looking at. Uh, and uh, also, um, particularly for uh, like uh, the, the Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, for example, sometimes they are the IT arm for uh, other parts of the government. So also, uh, making sure to have this uh, accommodated by other parts of the government. And um, I really see um, potential in having the government playing uh, uh, an, an, um, a role model here for, for everyone to follow. Uh, one more thing before handing you the floor back, Martin, is uh, best practices. And uh, here I would recall um, uh, the government of India and, and the great progress uh, they have in place and they are continuing to have. So it could serve as a good example for uh, other governments to follow as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. I mean, with over 22 official languages in one country, and nine different scripts. It's amazing to see the effort that has gone in there to make the scripts at least available. And it's the first step on the longer path of making it all fully usable. That's, that's clearly recognized. And indeed, uh, I think there's now a ministerial level working group on uh, universal acceptance. So that is uh, indeed an excellent example. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, uh, Danko. Uh, from, from your experience, uh, what advice would you have to policymakers? What does effective collaboration look like? Well, first, I would um, like to give my contribution from the point of view I discussed from the point of view of a small country. Uh, I believe sometimes in, in a smaller countries, it's difficult to get uh, involved in these global, global discussions. But in this case, we are discussing something that is critically important for 
uh, creating local internet. And the point of the internet uh, is to have a local content, local knowledge, and to create a local value in the country. So it is critically important to have this ability to use the language and the script that is really, really present in the country. So I believe uh, it is important for, uh, for people who are creating policies and, and uh, deciding on activities in such a countries to recognize the importance of internet identifiers in creating this infrastructure of the internet in the local content. So uh, even, uh, uh, even if it's a, a small country, it needs to be part of this global, global move, movement and global connection. Otherwise, uh, countries can be in danger of being left behind and sort of a digital curtain to, to create a division between countries that are, have this full internet experience and are able to con connect not only in physical sense, but in, in a real content and um, real, you know, participation sense to, to connect their citizens to the internet. So I would say that uh, no language and no script uh, must be left, uh, should be left behind. We should all get together and do everything we can that the uh, internet is really one internet, really global and accessible to everyone. Oh, f thank you. It make, makes a lot of sense. And, and it, it's good to hear from practice, from your personal experiences uh, with that. Uh, for all participants in the room, uh, please raise your hand, maybe indicate your question in the chat if you can, and, and we will give you the floor, uh, obviously, with the finger on the button that it's a justified contribution. Uh, uh, so, and of course, there's much more information on this and all this on the, the website of the uh, Universal Acceptance uh, Study Group, the UASG, and, and on the ICANN website and, and elsewhere. Uh, in the meanwhile, uh, while we are ready to answer your uh, questions, uh, question to uh, uh, the panel again. So, what should be happening next? What would be the next steps that uh, you would feel is most important? You've indicated the need for the balance between uh, content uh, descripts being available and the universal uh, acceptance of those scripts. Uh, so, so, so that is obviously key. I also heard Manal mention that, look back at the IP version six experience, we needed to be ready and we were well ready to serve IP version 6 before the big take up came. And uh, uh, also from the panel we've heard, well, some people have tried because there are now available domain names, but it doesn't always resolve in the email browser, disappointments lead to setbacks and, and, and things like that. How do we break this cycle? Um, any suggestions? Raise your hand and uh, the the host will unmute you, no doubt. You're on, please. I want to come back to something I talked about a little bit earlier, and that is the work we're doing internally in ICANN, which we call the next round of subpro, um, which is really our next big ability to to create the ability for people to have identifiers on uh, in their own local script language, whatever you want to call it. I mean, today we have about what is it, 1,600 uh, top-level domains uh, in total for what is it, five billion internet users. That number has been stable for a very long time. And, and when we did the when we did the first round of this, I mean, naturally many of of the top-level domains became uh, Latin script or even English. Uh, to some extent, French and Spanish sort of oriented, and I I think that with the in, with the hard work from the ICANN community, what they've done, that we're now trying going to the face to try to operate, so it's it's really an opportunity to create those local top level domains uh, in in local scripts, and I think I actually think that that will also show a demand, and and 
I might not be the best businessman in the world, but I, I usually think there is a demand. Someone wants to sell something. And by having the ability to, to uh, by having this ability, we create the demand. And I think that working together with manufacturers and, uh, and, and uh, governments and other ones, we can help to fulfill that. But it's going to be a really big thing. And we have to make sure that all the hard work we're doing with, with universal acceptance and also IDMs is something that's going to bear fruit there. So I'm, I'm actually quite positive. Uh, in the sense that I believe that this will create a sort of the next wave uh, who will bring things together um, and, and making sure that the internet becomes much more local in the future. Um, I got a comment on the side of this one, what I mean by, I mean, think, think about that. Many, we often, often many of the interactions we actually do on the internet is very local and often in our own language. Uh, you know, you, you're checking your, your chil, children's schools, you, you're booking a place for a vaccination, yeah. uh, you're booking you know, interactions with people. I mean, uh, I often interact with my kids uh, or with the internet, besides the fact I sit in the next room. So, so we have really to, to make sure that we create that ability and that I think it will create a demand uh, and that will, will sort of take us to the next step. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. And, and uh, yeah, again, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, I must say in capacity building workshops that I've seen uh, uh, locally for how do we make best use of the internet, which standards to adhere, et cetera. Uh, also, uh, universal acceptance has been discussion. And it was with great pleasure at some moment, we also could see that the big players like Apple, uh, Mozilla, etc., also contribute to the work there, uh, embracing it. Uh, we are not alone either. Uh, and we need more people to engage with us to work together to make it work. So, um, Manal, please. Um, thank you, Martin, and, and thank you, Joren, as well, for uh, your uh, insights. Um, so I, I just feel that um, one main challenge is that people who need universal acceptance most uh, are not online and we don't have a, a communication channel with them. So um, this is uh, one thing I was thinking about that uh, the, the people who need the universal acceptance most are not online, they don't know um, um, it exists and they don't know uh, it could facilitate uh, their experience. Um, and again, this brings me back to uh, the need to uh, convince the supply and the demand sides uh, at the same time, which is uh, also a challenge because uh, the supply side uh, don't want to move unless there is a, a need and a demand and the demand side is not uh, really aware of uh, the, the universal acceptance and its benefits. So we, we really need to, to uh, break this uh, vicious cycle. And the second thing is uh, the need for uh, the wide deployment so if uh, you are or your organization is universal acceptance ready, uh, this uh, is not enough. And uh, everyone needs to have universal acceptance ready in order for the universal acceptance to bear its fruits. And I already see a queue is forming. I'll stop here. And we definitely need to prioritize uh, other interventions. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, Danko, short, or shall we have our guest, other guests first? Uh, just a brief information. Please, please. Yeah, so uh, Universal Acceptance Steering Group has tested uh, websites and found out that about 11% of the top, of, top global websites would accept email address uh, in different scripts. So I just wanted also to point out Manal has stated the importance of the email addresses, but they are not, not only for communication, they're identifiers to log on to a bank account in different places. So I would propose that we spoke about driving the demand from the governments, but also communities could do more. Uh, communities cre could create a local 
websites could communicate with the universal acceptance steering group and test their local websites do they accept their email addresses and how well the universal acceptance is supported there so that will in a way create awareness and help drive the demand thanks yeah thank, thanks for that um uh can i ask uh laurent ferrali to be unmuted laurent, yes thank you very much martin uh yes um there is a question from joseph uh in the chat and um, he would like to ask uh, Joran uh, to comment about information, information sports in villages and how can we invite the people to contribute? Okay, uh, uh, Joseph is online, so we can ask him to speak to it himself. Yeah, so, Thank so you. thanks for that. Uh, Laurent is our remote uh, moderator. Thank you for picking that up, Joseph. No, can you unmute Joseph? No. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm on the yeah, I'm on the microphone as you see. Um, the, the background is I'm a professor at the, for digital health at the Center for Global Health, and we deployed information spots in rural villages in Africa, uh, focusing on English and Swahili in Tanzania on typical uh, tropical diseases uh, like cystic psychosis, HIV AIDS, DVC, and we had tremendous knowledge uptake from like 9% when we started with the baseline to 57% after 12 months. And that really triggered me to say, hey, if we empower people through putting an information spot into the village and letting people participate, that is where we grow the local knowledge. And I wanted to hear the comments from Goran on that. Thank you. On that case, Joran, please. Can you unmute Joran Morby, please? Host. Thanks. Thank you. I would like to learn more about that example so I can use that example uh, because it's it's actually exactly what we we're talking about. Uh, we when I mean, the internet was the the power of the internet for internet users is quite fantastic, and and what we from the technical sort of community provide is the opportunity for people to do what you did and and to see those that usage uh, going up and the knowledge and understanding going up. And you also pointed out that you can't only do it in English, you also have to do it in other scripts and other languages as well. And on that said, I think that one of the, Manal mentioned this as well, we have one of the big barriers we have is, to, is actually information about what you can do with the system. And one of the things that we are looking into right now is how can we sort of break that wall? Because as Manal said, the people we're trying to reach is not on the internet today. The one who needs it is not on the internet today. So how do we actually reach them? And how do we work with you know, anything from, from governments to telecom providers to content providers uh, to create the surrounding when it's actually possible to connect someone meaningfully uh, on this? And that, that is a, that's, that's gonna take a lot of thinking because as in many things that we are dealing with, uh, no one has done it before, which is one of the amazing things doing what we're doing. Many, many of those things that we do has not been fought out in history before. So uh, the, it would be, I actually, if you could, Joseph, I'm easy to find. Uh, could you send me an email and talk more about what you actually done? Because that sounds very interesting to me. Sure, I will do. I post my contacts in the chat and uh, those who are here physically, we have the booth just outside, but I post my contact data so that uh, we can follow up. Thank you. You also actually have a board member in the room, Avery. Yeah, to just uh, provide it to Avery Doria so uh, only those who need to get your email address get it and you <laughs> don't get other messages. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Thank you for your input. Uh, last but not least uh, for today, uh, Fred Papo Azore, please. Can you unmute Fred? Thank you. Fred, you're unmuted. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, my name is Fred Kwajo Azori. I'm speaking from Ghana, and uh, I am one of the 2021 IGF Youth Ambassadors. Uh, yes, so the context that is being discussed, uh, I think uh, I wanted to bring in a preamble which Mana uh, indirectly 
uh, commented on. That is the people we are trying to reach, uh, the people we are trying to provide connectivity to, uh, actually not online. And so uh, as part of my paper submission uh, for to be selected as an IGF Youth Ambassador, I was looking at internet governance, uh, the the unconnected perspective. And so I try to ask a few questions uh, and I realized that most people find it very difficult to even understand what the internet itself is before they, uh, you, let's say, before they can think of getting to know how to get connected to the internet. And so uh, the, the, I think, Goran mentioned that it's very difficult for us to actually look at the different perspectives and how we are going to get those uh, that are not online to be able to come online. One of the things that I would say as a suggestion is that, first of all, uh, from the parts of the world that I come, we realize that a lot of people do not even have access to computers or even regular ICT knowledge. And so with this, it is very difficult to get these people online, even if you provide them with the infrastructure, even if you provide them with the connectivity, it will be very difficult for them to come online without the literacy attached to it. And so we can start at some levels depending on the locations or the geographic areas. So at some geographical areas, we, we would be looking at providing basic ICT knowledge to uh, those people within those localities, whilst we try to provide infrastructure to people who already have uh, some basic ICT knowledge. Then at some point, we, we are able to come back to the people who had no ICT knowledge at all, and we are able to provide them with the basic internet infrastructure or connectivity, mobile connectivity infrastructure. And we can be doing all these things, probably also having uh, a, an inference on the fact that community networks is becoming very common these days. And so there are various aspects of uh, the solutions that can be done, but we have, to, I think the speaker who is on site made mention of the information systems that they deployed at, uh, uh, I think Tanzania and other African communities. And these systems, I believe, allows them to be able to understand what is going on locally. So when you plan ahead and want to deliver a solution to such a community, because of the engagement and because of the, the information that you already have, it becomes much easier. And so the gap is continually getting wider and wider as we are not able to get to the offline people. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fred, for your, your excellent remarks. Uh, Joron, you would want to react on this? And, and please, there's also a question from Michael Palic in the chat. Maybe you can answer that too. And then we'll round off. Hey, uh, dear host, can you please unmute Euro? Morbi? Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. I, I think what you said is so important. And I think that there's a growing realization uh, that there is no business model uh, that can, can put all those people online. It's much more than that. And that's why I think it's, and I go back to what Manel said, we have to work together from the technical community with the uh, policymakers in the governments. We have, to, we have to work with teachers. We have to do this so differently. If, I mean, if it was so easy that you know, there's some money to be made, someone will come there, but I don't think it will. I think that we really have to rethink and really go back to what the internet is all about by connecting people. So I agree with you. Oh, everything you said, it was like, yeah, I agree. That's the problem. Yes, I agree. And the and, and good thing is that that realization is starting to spread, especially in Africa. There are several initiatives I know about where we actually started to talk about to come together to see what we can do. I also take the opportunity to answer uh, Michael's uh, question in the 
uh, in the chat about what we're thinking to do. Yes, I mean, we are in the process, as you know, uh, to start looking into how we can how we can enhance the uh, possibility for for other regions to have an, uh, to be online. And I think that one of the mistakes, not mistakes, it's not a mistake. One of the evolutions we need to do is to make sure that we have more IDNs universal acceptance, so top level domains can actually be really used as well. Um, so I think that's why it goes so well. Universal acceptance and IDNs is not only for the next round, but it's important in, in together with the next round. And in that, uh, you know that the community have had really interesting discussions about how to uh, how to set up the system for doing this from a money perspective, from uh, the, the world has moved on a lot. We have much more backend providers. We can probably do things differently. And, and that's a conversation that I, I, I know that the ICANN community is well averse to have. But I, I feel from the from from the from what I understand from the ICAN community, this this is really something that is on top of our mind, which I'm really grateful for as a person. So I hope I answered all questions. Now over to you, Martin. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you everybody. And sorry, uh, the hour has flown by, and uh, I think it's been very useful to hear about all these concepts. And of course, the internet isn't about IDNs alone and universal acceptance alone. As Joseph clearly indicated, it's also about connectivity. As several governments already indicated, it's about making locals uh, getting access to information uh, in their own uh, scripts. It's also clearly about security uh, uh, that uh, the internet, when you, as soon as you're connected, uh, you're part of that, that, that bigger thing where you need to take care of yourself as well. But universal acceptance is a key thing and a key step. And uh, I would love to end this hour with an uh, uh, ask to all providers to please make your systems UA ready. And there are standards for there on the internet. Uh, join UA working groups, help progress it. And, and for you all also, you can initiate, take local action, set up local regional working groups to understand what UA can do for you and why it's, uh, why it's important to uh, get into it. Because it is, as Manal said, uh, demand and, 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 uh, and offer. And it only can uh, start to grow a demand to become some kind of more interesting business case if people understand why they should ask for it, why it's so worthwhile. So on all these fronts, make it ready, raise awareness, and, and, and get active. Uh, that is uh, the call to you. Uh, thank you all for participation. Uh, deep respect for the hosts to do their work under difficult circumstances as well. And, and thank you for, for hosting us so well uh, at your best ability. And uh, uh, all those in the room with Avri, thank you. Uh, Avri, thank you. And, and all those online, uh, thank you for your listening. And dear panel, uh, you've been very, very clear. And I think this message will go a long way. So thank you very much. Uh, this session is over. <laughs>